Hi, I'm Daniel Bach from Cascade Microtech, and I'm going to be talking about production test RF calibration for multi-dot probe cards and how to get the most accurate measurements in your test cell. First, I'm going to talk about what is calibration and why is that important. Then we're going to talk about what are the differences between a single site and multi-site calibration strategy in order then to investigate what are the differences and how does it affect your final measurements, we did a simulation investigation of single site versus multi-site. And finally at the end we're going to create a small summary of the results. Why do you need calibration? You want to be able to guarantee that you are measuring your device under test and not your test equipment. Your test equipment includes your network analyzer, the probes, and the cabling, which introduce errors into your final measurement. Calibration is the method that is used to remove these errors. The only thing you're measuring is the green box or your device under test. Now, how does calibration work? It characterizes the RF performance parameters of your test hardware. And as you can see in this schematic below, it's showing your S parameters, which are S21, S22, S12 and S11, which are your device parameters, but then there's all these other terms that are coming from your test setup, which is including E sub S, E sub R, E sub D, E sub L, E sub X, and E sub T, which are six terms for your forward measurement error box. Now, once you get what these parameters are, you can then mathematically remove these from your final measurements to look at the performance of just your device. Now looking at a little bit of the more complex math for a two-port error correction, there's the forward model and the reverse model that's looking at from port one for your forward and port two for your reverse. And as you can see, there's a total of 12 error terms that are in each measurement in order to remove the probe card and cabling errors. Now the advantage today is all of the network analyzers on the market do this mathematics internally so you no longer have to do it by hand or with an Excel. But looking at this, the mathematics is useful because then you can actually see how each error term affects your final measurement. In order to do your calibration, you do need several pieces of equipment. Perhaps the most important one on top of your test hardware is your calibration substrate. You use this to characterize the measurement path of your test hardware, which includes the cables and the probe card. In order to characterize it, you measure some combination of short, open, load, and through RF standards. Because these standards on a calibration substrate are well-defined and understood, and you know what they should look like when you're only measuring the standard, you can use that then to characterize the error terms that were in the previous slide. What about multi -dut? In order to improve cost of ownership, many companies are moving to multi-dot test. This is because by going to multi-dot, you can increase the number of wafers tested per probe card so your probe card lasts a longer lifetime of wafers. The other advantage is by doing a multi-dot test, you can increase the total speed of test time by reducing the number of indexing steps required to move across a wafer. But when you're doing multi-site, each site can have slightly different measurements, which requires site-to-site -site correlation of your final measurements after calibration, which can be a very difficult thing to do in your test cell. Comparing single-site cal and multi-site cal, you can actually see that you can discern which site a measurement came from. The right-hand side is using a four-site probe card, and one of the sites you can see is different than the other three because of the way the single site cal operates. Now if you move to a multi-site calibration strategy on the left-hand side, you can see that there's actually no way to be able to tell the difference between each site on the probe card. And this is actually the state you'd want to be in in your final test cell, which requires no additional correlation between test sites. Now what is the difference in a single site layout and a multi-site layout for your calibration substrate? If you look on the left hand side, this is a single site calibration substrate layout. 
where it has a single pad site for each calibration standard. So you can see there's a single short standard, then there's alignment marks below it, an open, alignment marks, a load, and then a through. The right hand side is a quad site probe card calibration substrate where each site on the probe card is contacting the same standard at the same time. So that is every site is shorted, open, load, or through. And one additional advantage of using a multi-site cal substrate is the number of steps required in order to calibrate is reduced by a factor of four since you can actually measure each site at the same time on the same step, where on the single site you have to do four steps per standard. In order to investigate further what is going on with multi-site and single site calibration, we use simulation to control all other factors. This includes environmental conditions, probe to pad alignment, and even just cable motion. Also, I simulated two die with the same ground return. Now the final comparison between these was done with two different scenarios. One scenario was looking at the error terms when both ports are being controlled or actually both sites are being controlled. So when site one is shorted, the other site is shorted when you're calibrating. The other scenario was looking at error terms when only one port is controlled, but the other can be at a random state. This is when site one is shorted, the other one could be short, open, load, or through. And then this was done for each standard measurement with a random cycling through the other standard, so you would never knew exactly what state the other site was in. We also then generated representative measurement parameters for a bandpass filter. This is a filter with a center frequency of 2.6 gigahertz with a 3 dB width of 100 megahertz. Now for this evaluation, we used SVLT calibration, but in order to do that successfully, we had to generate calibration coefficients. The calibration coefficients were extracted using LRRM to calculate the values of the inductance and capacitance of the various standards. So now the probe card, which we simulated, was based off of a pyramid probe card. So we had 50 millimeters of O31 semi-rigid coax from a connector, and then that was connected to a 10 millimeter microstrip transmission line that is a model based on the pyramid probe membrane technology. The membrane layout had a two-filter layout. Each filter had a single input and output pair, and dot one is port one and two, dot two is port three and four, and as you can see, they're reasonably close together and they had a shared ground return since that is one of the main coupling venues for the energy. I then simulated the performance of a single channel of the probe card to see would it meet our standard outgoing performance. Our standard outgoing performance is 3 dB insertion loss out to the specified frequency, better than 10 dB return loss up to the specified frequency, and as the figure on the right hand shows, it more than met those conditions. I also simulated what is the crosstalk between two adjacent lines, and it is better than 55 dB at 2.5 gigahertz. We then also looked at the measurements before calibration. So this would be analogous to a cable cal in your test setup. The measurements prior to calibration between site one and site two are actually identical with each dot. This is an ideal scenario and was done purposefully in order to remove any other error terms in the measurement. After calibration in the controlled scenario where every site was being short open loader through during the calibration, we then looked at the delta between the final device measurements. We primarily looked at S11 and S21 for these differences, and as you can see, the measurement differences were basically in the noise. For the insertion loss, the difference between them was better was less than minus 80 dB, and the return loss was better than minus 70 dB which means that in a final test setup, you would not need to do correlation between site one and site two, since they are basically identical. Now looking at the uncontrolled scenario, here, dot one was being calibrated while dot two was in some unknown state, and then we use that to create the calibration error terms. You can see you actually get a bimodal distribution in the final measurements between site one and site two. This indicates that there would need to be some amount of correlation between site one and site two in your test cell. 
Now looking at the error terms that were actually generated from SOLT, you can see out of the six error terms, three of them were being affected the largest. The error terms for directivity, source matching, and load matching. And you can see that actually the source matching had the largest variation between Site 1 and Site 2. Now looking at the circuit schematic that was shown earlier, what was interesting is the three terms that are being affected the largest are actually coupling between the insertion loss and return loss of the circuit schematic. But then the rest of the terms are being affected less than 5%. So the second site actually affects what the load impedance looks like at a low level, which then is being seen in your final measurement. So in summary, the most accurate measurements in a multi-site application is to make a calibration substrate that mirrors the multi-site layout. The advantage for this is at the final test cell, you do not need to do correlation between site to site since they will have nearly identical measurements. Thank you very much.